Did you know almost every culture on earth has their own variation of rice and beans? Allegedly, that's because when you combine these two, you get a complete protein. But is there any truth to that? Or is it just a myth? In this video, I'm going to show you how this protein combining idea started, whether or not science supports it, and if it's worth worrying about in your own diet. So how did this myth come to be? Well, like I mentioned earlier, historically every culture has their own take on rice and beans. You've got a more classic take on it with gallo pinto in Costa Rica, which is probably more what comes to mind when you think rice and beans. But you've also got pilav with chickpeas in Turkey, or mujadera found in places like Palestine and Jordan, which is often made with lentils and bowler. And these hearty combinations of a legume and a whole grain make a lot of sense. After all, they're cheap, convenient, filling, and extremely nutritious. They're full of protein, complex carbs, iron, fiber, and tons of other micronutrients that help support heart health and blood pressure, for example, while still being incredibly tasty. So it makes sense this type of combination would have served many cultures historically and even to this day. But people also use the prevalence of these dishes as proof that protein combining is something we need to think about. Maybe our ancestors were onto something. But did they know about protein, and more specifically, amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein, like back in the times of Jesus? Probably not. Or, I don't know, show me the scripture. On the other hand, these days we know a lot more about how protein works, and we've got studies that give us the insights we're looking for. That being said, before we go deeper, there's a few things you need to understand about food before we start looking at protein specifically. So foods are mostly made up of three macronutrients, protein, carbs, and fat. But here's what most people get wrong. They don't realize mostly all foods are made up of a combination of these three. So this jar of beans, for example, lots of people would call this a protein, but it's not just a protein. It's also made up of carbs and fat. And as a matter of fact, it's mostly made up of carbs. Or take bread, pasta, and potatoes, for example. No question here, these are definitely carbs, right? Well, again, that's only somewhat true. They're mostly carbs, but did you know that 13% of calories of white bread come from protein? Or eating one cup of potatoes, which is 265 grams, would have four grams of protein and a little bit of fat as well? So all food is usually made up of different proportions of these three main macronutrients. Protein itself works in a similar way you can break it down into 20 different amino acids, and depending on the source of the protein, it'll have different proportions of amino acids. And those amino acids work a lot like puzzle pieces to support your muscles. You need all of them to come together to give you everything you need. Now, here's the thing. Some protein sources offer a pretty equal distribution of the amino acids, while other sources are more concentrated in some amino acids, and less so in others. More specifically, animal protein tends to have a more equal distribution of amino acids compared to plant proteins, which tend to be more concentrated or specialized. And so this is where the idea of protein combining comes into play. It's a bit of a breaking bad situation. For those of you who watched the show, you'll remember that Walter White was a high school chemistry teacher who was able to cook up some seriously good product. But he had one big weakness. He didn't have the network to sell it. That's where Jesse comes in his former student. Jesse didn't have the experience or the education to produce the product that Walter could, at least not at first anyways, but he had the connections to start distributing the product and together they each had strengths that complemented the other's weakness and together they built an empire. And that's gonna be your muscle building empire when you start eating rice and beans. But yeah, that's how rice and beans work in theory. They have different concentrations of amino acids that complement each other well. Or in other words, if you eat them together, they'll cover each other's weaknesses. So that's the theory behind protein combining. But this has led people to call plant protein incomplete. But if you ask me, that's a bit misleading. Here's why. Incomplete implies that they don't have certain amino acids at all. But if we look at the profile of different plant foods, you'll notice they have all the amino acids, just maybe a bit less of some and a bit more of others. But also, why you gotta be so negative? Damn, like this is a glass half empty way to look at it because you're only looking at the negative sides of these proteins. Like check out 20 grams worth of protein of lentils and whole wheat bread. As you can see, lentils are super high in these two amino acids right here, isoleucine and phenylalanine, and oats are also high in phenylalanine and isoleucine, and cysteine too, even though that one isn't essential. Isoleucine and this P1, Phenylalanine. Is this English? Phenylalanine. Phenyl, I don't fucking know. Phenylalanine. Phenylalanine. And as we can also see, they both have all the amino acids. So 
Calling plant proteins incomplete seems a bit inaccurate. Like what if we called plant proteins specialized proteins that offered unique concentrations of certain amino acids, whereas animal protein was unspecialized with a more bland distribution. See, now you're focusing on the positive aspect of the plant protein and it paints animal protein in a more negative light. And that's just from the naming convention. It's like when you go to a restaurant, is the bread free? No, it's complimentary. But so why does this matter? Maybe there's a reason why they use that naming convention because perhaps plant protein is inferior or requires more planning. And if that's the case, that has really important consequences for people. I mean, think about it. Imagine you're trying to check out from your favorite coffee shop and they say, hey, do you wanna join our loyalty program and get a stamp? You'd be like, yeah, sure. But as soon as they say, okay, I'll need your email address. I'm like, Ugh, you know what, F it, never mind. Too much effort. And it's the same way with the diet change. That's already a huge undertaking for most people. And the more perceived obstacles, even if they're honestly trivial, the less likely you are to make those changes. After all, you might be someone who just wants to reduce your environmental impact, or you want to do better by animals, or you're just looking into forms of protein that will improve your blood pressure and cholesterol levels. Do you need to carry around a guidebook for the rest of your life to tell you what proteins you need to combine? Because that sounds pretty awful. And for most people, too much of a hassle. So is this a real trade-off that you need to consider, or is it simpler than that? So first, let's understand if there's any truth to protein combining at all. Research has shown that as long as you're getting all the amino acids in the right quantities, it doesn't matter if it comes from animal or plant protein. The strength and muscle results are the same. In other words, it seems like the theory is true, which, wait, are we happy about that? Well, it's too early to say. What that does mean is the good news is that it seems like your plant protein can be just effective as supporting your muscles as animal protein. But there's that combining thing, like how long do you have before eating one protein to eat the next? Is it five minutes? Is it five seconds? Like, do you need to worry about it? Well, here's the thing. Your body is smart enough to use the amino acids that you consume over a period of time and then combine them later. So it's not that you have to eat every meal perfectly paired at all. You can have your beans for lunch and then later for dinner have the rice. And in fact, a study came out last year where they tested that concept. They had three groups of participants. And for one meal, they had one group get their protein from a complete animal-based source, which was lean beef. Another group got their protein from complementary protein sources. So they gave them beans and whole wheat bread. And the third group only got their protein from an incomplete source, either beans or whole wheat bread. They found that as long as within a 24 hour period, the participants got all their amino acids, there was no difference in muscle protein synthesis stimulation. And you might find this interesting that even if you did only eat 2000 calories of white bread in a day, you'd still basically hit every single amino acid target, just barely missing the slicing target. And one more slice of bread would probably put that over hundred easily. In general though, throughout the day, you're eating so many different types of food. And remember, even that potato from earlier has protein. So you're always picking up amino acids in every meal from different sources, even if you don't realize it. So it'll all balance out without you having to even think about it. I've been vegan for over five years and I've never in my life worried about tracking amino acids. I just eat normal food throughout the day like beans, lentils, and fruits. And now I'm in the best shape of my life. I don't try to get one gram of protein per pound or anything. I usually sit at around 0.7 grams per pound or 1.6 grams per kilogram, which according to this meta-analysis was where you'll stop seeing gains from increased protein intake anyways. What's more, plant protein has some huge advantages over animal protein when it comes to living longer, for example. One study found that replacing just 3% of calories from animal protein to plant protein led to a 10% decrease in premature death. In this video, I'll show you seven easy hacks to easily get more plant protein into your diet.